It's toward the end of your Bible. It's one of the last epistles that is written there in your Bible. The book of James. This is James, the brother of the Lord Jesus Christ, writing to his church who have been dispersed. We'll read the first, we'll read verses 2 through 8. The word of the living God, dear church. James chapter 1, verse 2. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces, produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not be supposed, must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double minded man, unstable in all his ways. Let's pray, church. <clears throat> Lord, as we continue to worship now, Lord, as we have your word open, Lord, sometimes we forget that this is the word of the one who created all things, that the ruler, the kingdom, the, the, the king of the kingdom, the, the creator of heaven and earth has written down his word for us. This isn't a textbook. This isn't a novel. This isn't some fiction story that we just think is good help for us. And it's the best way that we can make it through this life. No, these are the very words of you, our living God. So help us to take them with the, with the reverence, the heaviness, the weightiness that is carried in your word. And use your word, Lord, to cause us to be sanctified by your word. Your word is truth, O Lord. Christ is our, is our truth. We expect, Lord, to receive him in his word. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. Well, I'm sure that many of us who've been walking in this Christian world, as it were, who've been walking the Christian in the Christian faith for some time, I'm sure many of us can remember a time when well-intended, well-meaning brothers and sisters supposedly acting on wisdom have made very, very, very foolish decisions. All in the name of wisdom. Well, I've thought this through. Well, I have peace about it, right? All those little Christian sayings that you hear thrown out in the world, in the Christian world, and you have to really say, there's not much wisdom in those decisions. We have come across those who really think that they're making decisions, that they're handling life circumstances in a way that's biblical, yet you look at their decision, it's not much biblical uh, realities there. There's not much uh, biblical weight to their decisions. In fact, they're mostly making decisions on what provides for them the happiest result, even if it doesn't really come from the Word. Uh, I was reading a book this week that was uh, sent to us called Authentic Ministry. And in that book, he makes reference to a little book that I had to read for seminary. And it always stuck with me because it talked about sophomores. Is any sophomores in the room? Sorry for what I'm about to say because the word just means what it, what, what, what it means. A sophomore, by definition, a sophomore is two Greek words. Sophos, which means wisdom. Sophia, right? That's where we get that from. Philosophy, right? Wisdom. And then moros, moronic, Morons, sorry, I didn't come up with the word sophomore. If you're in the 10th grade, I'm sorry. Hopefully you're not that, right? But the point is this. There is a, remember the freshmen are, are coming into high school. They're, 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 they're new. They're coming to seminary. They're fresh. They're excited to learn. And then when they become sophomores, what happens? They got a little wisdom now. They got some knowledge, but they are still a little too foolish, Right? So they have this knowledge, but they don't have the maturity to go with that knowledge. They have a sense of truth, but they don't have the, 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 the wisdom to handle that truth. So really, they become wise fools or foolish wise people, as it were. 
So that really is what captures what I think that largely a lot of Christians are in that stage of being sophomores. They have some sense of, of wisdom. They have some sense of the truth. But yet their decisions do not reflect a true biblical understanding of what wisdom looks like in time and space. That's what we're going to get into this morning is what is this thing called wisdom? So let me just give you a spoiler alert. Wisdom is not a thing. Wisdom is not knowledge. Wisdom is not intellectualism. Wisdom is not, uh, not academia. Wisdom is not science. If anything has proved that the past few years, we know that wisdom is not, by definition, purely science. What is wisdom? Wisdom is a person. Wisdom is Christ. Read the scriptures. When you look at the Old Testament, it's always talking about wisdom as a person. Go and seek her. Go and, and, and purchase her as it were. Make it your aim to get her, to get her, to get wisdom. And then you see that element develop in the New Testament. And what do you see? Christ has become our wisdom. The, the cross is our wisdom. So at the outset, we need to realize as we go into the text that all the blessings of the wisdom of God flow from Christ, clothed in his gospel, clothed in who he is as our substitute, as our savior. And when we have Christ, then we have it all. If Christ, then joy. If Christ, then wisdom. If Christ, then maturity. If Christ, then all the blessings come. No Christ, no blessings, even if it looks like a blessing. Right, we've seen a lot of people make decisions that it looks like it's going well for them. Well, I got news. It rains on the just and the unjust. People who make uh, decisions that are not wise can still be blessed on the, black, on the back end, but it's not coming from a, a position of biblical wisdom. So as we get into this, we have to maintain wisdom is a person. His name is is Christ. And what James is picking up here in verse 5, will be in verses 5 through 8 for our, this morning's study, it's a continuation of what we heard last week about the joy of blessings, the, 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 the testing of our faith, the, the steadfastness that's being given to us as we're in trials. And what James picks up here in verse 5 is right on the same heel, it's, it's on the heels of that, right? Actually in the Greek, these two sentences are actually combined with a conjoining word, but it's not here in our English translations. So we must see verse 4 go straight into verse 5. Read it with me again in verse 5. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God. We'll stop there. See, at the very beginning, in trials, church, we are so prone to do what? To act, right? When something comes our way, when you have a job offer, when you have uh, that medical information, when you're in the thick of it with a coworker, whatever it is, whatever trial it is, whatever uh, a pooling of the flesh it is, you're just prone to want to make a decision right then and there. That's why James will later go on to say, be slow to speak. Be slow to speak. Why? Because our first reaction is knee jerk. And you want to respond right then and there. James is saying, confess something first. James is saying, take the route of humility. Your first thing in these trials, in these, in these uh, testings of your faith, as it were, is confessing that you have a lack. James is not supposing that there's someone in this congregation that does not lack wisdom. Church, to some degree, we all lack wisdom. To some degree, we all need help in this area. To some degree, we all got to start every single trial that comes our way by saying, I need to ask for wisdom. Otherwise, we're going to lean on our own understanding. So here, the path to wisdom is humility. A lot of people think that the opposite uh, reaction to wisdom is foolishness. No, the opposite reaction to wisdom is actually pride. And pride produces foolishness. What do I mean by that? You know how prideful we have to be to be going through a circumstance of life and not turn our attention heavenward. You know how prideful that is? To say, I'm going through a very intense time. I'm going through a trial. I'm suffering. And we don't turn to God. And we don't stop and ask God for help. You know how much that confesses about your heart and, and shows you really don't think that you need the Lord to help you. What we should be doing is in our frailty, in our weakness, in our understanding of our re remaining corruption, we should be those types of people. We should be a church. We should be Christians that say, I need to think about that. I'm not going to react in my flesh. Can I have a moment? 
right? We need to go to the Lord before we go to Google. We need to go to the Lord before we go to Facebook and throw it all out there for everyone to offer their opinion on our life circumstance. We need to go to the Lord before we go to those friends that just tell us what we want to hear. I always tell this story that when you have a woman who wants to get desert, uh, divorced, where does she go? To other divorced women. Why? Because they're going to tell her what she wants to hear. They're going to tell her, hey, you should do this. You should do that. Hey, you don't need that. Oh, my life is much better since whatever. No, we need to be Christians who go to the Lord, who slow down, who say, I need to talk with my Lord. I need to ask for help. I don't feel that I have the ability in my own strength to make these decisions. Lord, I'm confused. Lord, help me. Lord, carry me. Lord, you say that trials are for my good. You say that trials are for my blessing. Lord, you say that you're testing my faith. Well, my faith is in you. So you help me, Lord. That's how you go to the Lord in prayer. That's how you ask Him, church. You say that these things are supposed to bless me? Well, then bless me, Lord, because I don't see the blessing in it. Temptations always, always cause us, church, to begin to say things like, well, if God really loved me, would He be putting me through this? Or if you're on the fence of Christianity or not, you might say things like, well, if God was really good, if God was really uh, whatever you want to uh, make him out to be, then why would he allow this? Why would he allow this to happen? You see, church, God says that for his children, everything that comes their way is a blessing to them. It's for their good. That's what we covered last week. All that comes to the path of a Christian is for their own good. And really, what we have in the thick of fights or, 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 or temptations or whatever your trial is, there you can either make a decision that glorifies Christ or that gratifies your flesh. That's what it comes down to. Are you going to glorify Christ in your decision making or are you going to gratify the flesh? And the smallest of trials, church, the smallest of testings, can truly cause such a great ruin to your faith. Never take any small trial uh, in, in a way that shows that it's trivial. Oh, this is not that important. No, it is that important. Because as James goes on to say, every sin starts small, but its desire is to devour you. Its desire is to give a full, a pregnated uh, woman, as it were, of sin. Every sin that starts this small, its desire is to completely overtake you. So never take any circumstance of life lightly, church. That's why James is so uh, adamant about this to his church. Remember, they're going, they're dispersed, they're having to flee. They're going to new cities, they're going to new areas. James knows if there's ever a time when these trials might get the best of them, it's when they're now experiencing something new where they're in the new season of life. Maybe they don't have the entire church community together. Their pastor's not with them. Their pastor's not here. So James is saying, you must, you must slow down. You must ask the Lord for wisdom. You must seek out wisdom. Do not be prideful. You must truly have a disposition that shows that my wisdom comes from Christ. Wisdom is a disposition. We don't want worldly wisdom, church. Wisdom is not academics. Wisdom is not uh, just purely street smarts. Wisdom is not common sense. None of those things are wisdom. There's elements of wisdom in those things, but none of those are biblical wisdom. So what I would say is wisdom is delighting in Christ and who He is for you. Because when you do that, church, when you delight in Christ, when you're tethered to Christ, remember those old tetherball games and the ball would go around and around and around? That's you. But you got to be tethered to Christ. If that ball goes flying off because you're not tethered to Christ, you're gone. You have to be orbiting around Christ in all that you do. Your identity has to be in Christ. You have to look to Christ and say, when has Christ ever failed me? When has Christ ever not been sufficient for me? When has Christ... Christ ever proven himself to be anything other than a perfect Savior, Lord, and Master. And when you do that, now you can begin to live life and make decisions in a way that is tethered to that. Because what happens when a circumstance comes your way, church? 
what happens when you are, are, are having to meet the trials of life? You're going to begin to be wrestling with who you are in Christ. What do I mean by that? Let me just give you, I don't like doing examples because then someone might have an example out there and they think, oh, he's using me as an example. That's not what, what, what I intend to do. But let me just give a very, very simple example here. You imagine you are a father and you work a job and you get approached to take a job that is in another area, another state, another city, I don't know. And it's $30,000 more a year. And that would make the biggest difference in your financial life. Wisdom is slowing down, stepping back and saying, $30,000 is not all that matters in this situation. Cold, hard finances is not the most important thing. Is there a church where I'm going? Is there a like-minded body of believers where I'm going? Is there a group of men that can help me transition into this new area? What is this new job like? What are the hours at this new job? Uh, is the environment uh, something that will benefit my soul? Currently, I'm doing these things at work and I'm enjoying it. And I feel like I'm glorifying the Lord in my work here. Can I do that here? Or will I be grudging and complaining and now being tested every single day in my faith just for $30,000 more a year? That's a big amount, but it's not the uh, amount that's worth your soul now you apply that to anything church you must be able to step back and say this does this trial this testing this circumstance does it ultimately glorify christ when i make a decision is the end and the ultimate uh, question that i ask myself is does this bring the most glory to christ or is it merely bringing me some sense of happiness Church, your happiness is not the most important thing. It's not. That which gives you instant gratification is not the most important thing. Why do you think this world is selling you on things like two-day shipping, microwavable food, just go buy your food instead of growing it, all these things, because they want you to become uh, prone to instant gratification. You won't find that in the Scriptures. The Scriptures is a long battle the scriptures is taking a step back and asking those difficult questions the scriptures are full with delayed gratification hey store up in the harvest for the time of winter so church when you're asking yourself in trials and circumstances when you're deciding when you're responding it must come from a place of being delighting uh, of delighting and being secure in Christ rather than coming from a, a, an emotional place that's just full of worry and fear or just full of wanting to gratify what you think is the best thing for your flesh. I've seen, we've seen many Christians handle trials in a very foolish way, church. We've seen many Christians and, and we continue to see many Christians in the blogosphere or on YouTube or whatever literally make decisions that are not in step with the word why? Because they want to be liked. They want to be liked by men more than having the fear of God in them. Church, whatever we go through anything, in every circumstance, we have to, church, we have to ask ourselves, does this bring glory to Christ? That's wisdom. You begin with who you are in Christ, and you do a full circle as a word, and you say, who I am in Christ is this bringing him glory by who I am in Christ. Let's go back to that example. You're a father and you have this job before you and you have your cousins and your family and your ear saying, this is your chance. All those times you failed. This is your chance. You have to take it. It's, it's a no brainer. Someone who's in Christ will say, I worry about what Christ thinks of me. I know who I am in Christ. Your thoughts, your opinions, your comments are trying to pull me to make a decision purely based on what you think of me. But I know what Christ thinks of me. You could do this through everything, church. Every decision, right? You need to be grounded and tethered to Christ in your decision making or else you literally will be tossed to and fro and everyone's thoughts of you will hold you captive. What so-and-so thinks of me, what, what, what that person thinks of me, or the testing of my faith really will, will, will expose your true identity. 
Like I said many times, trials expose who you really are, church. Trials expose if you're really in Christ or if you're just in and out of Christ. That's why James says here, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God. And this is the beautiful a reality to our God who gives generously to all without reproach and it will be given him. God loves to give wisdom. If my son asks me a question about how he can mature as a man, do you think I'm going to withhold that question from him? No, because I delight. I want my son to become mature. I want my son to become wise. Church, our God is a much better father than I am. Do you think that if you truly go to God and say, I'm lacking wisdom, do you really think that your loving father won't supply you with wisdom? Look what the verse says. He will give generously. He loves to give. He delights to give. He's not a Scrooge. He's not some, some, some tightwad with his blessings. But if you see him as such, you're going to be scared to ask him. But we need to expect so much from God and really expect for him to give it because that's what he says in his word. And we hold him to his word because he is faithful to his promises and he gives without reproach. You know, sometimes we give to our children and we say, well, last time you did this with this. So should I really give it to you? That's how we give. We give with reproach. God does not do that. God says, last time you messed this up, and I'm still going to bless you if you ask for it. You didn't handle this the way you should have last time, but you're coming to me again. I give without reproach. God loves to give. Church, if we don't have this type of God in our prayer closet, I know why you do not experience power from on high because you're not going to the biblical God. But when you go to the biblical God and say, I have this circumstance. I lack wisdom. I am weak. I am not smart enough. I'm not shrewd enough. Lord, I need to have this from you. I can tell you by this verse, he will give it to you. But do we go there? Do we actually go to Him in prayer? Or are we double-minded? As we see here in verses 6 through 8. Read it with me. But let him ask in faith with no doubting. For the one who doubts is like, the, like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all of his ways the opposite of faith is doubt trials and temptations and all that happens in this life will cause you to doubt they'll cause you to doubt your lord they'll cause you to doubt who you are in christ they'll cause you to doubt if you're really satisfied in christ you know we say those things all the time i'm purely satisfied in christ then christ takes something out of your life and you're miserable you said you were completely satisfied in Christ. You see, church, when we go to the Lord in prayer, we need to ask in faith. What does that mean? Does that mean trying really hard to think, oh, I really think this is going to happen. This is really going to happen. It's really going to happen. You peek your one eye open. Has it happened? No, it hasn't happened yet. I'm not thinking hard enough, right? That's not what asking in faith means. It's not what we muster up. Let me show you something else. Does faith save us? That's a trick question. Yes and no. How does faith save us? Is it faith itself that saves us? No. It's in who our faith is in. Faith is the mode, but it's the objectivity of our faith. Where is our faith looking to? If I have faith in an idol, does that get me saved because I'm saved by faith? No. My faith is in the triune God. So when here it says, ask in faith. What it means is saying, not asking in your strength, in your ability, and you really believing something. No, it's saying when you ask in faith, you're asking in faith of the object of your faith. So what you do, church, and I recommend this every time I talk about prayer. What you do when you pray is you open this up and you look at who God is and you pray that back to him. Lord, you say, if I ask, you'll give it to me. James 1, you said it, Lord. That's what asking in faith means. Asking in faith is saying things like, Lord, you're my father. I'm your son. Are you going to give me a rock when I ask you for a fish? Lord, you care for me. Lord, you gave your son for me. That's what asking in faith means. It's by looking to who he is, seeing him in his word, clinging to the promises of the gospel. 
That's what praying in faith means. You look at what God has promised you in his gospel and you say, Lord, this is what you're saying. Are you going to lie to me? Are you going to be unfaithful to me? So, Lord, give me these things. Lord, help me in these things. That's what asking in faith. And we ask in faith because he loves to give. He loves to bless. Church, if I had a father who was a millionaire and he loved to give me his money, you think I'd be scared to ask him? If I had a father who had 30 businesses and he was like, do you want one of these businesses? You think I'd be scared? But why don't we go to God who's better than a millionaire? Who has more, more than businesses? He has a cattle on a thousand hills. He has a storehouse in heaven. Our God lacks nothing. That's why James says you'll be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Because when your trial has finally ran its course, you'll realize, you'll realize I lack nothing. How can I lack something when I have the one who has everything? When I have the one who's decreed all things, when I have the father who's literally carrying me as his child through every circumstance of life, that's the point of your testing is you need to get to a point where you say, I'm lacking wisdom. Why? Because I'm looking to, to, to this. I'm taking my eyes off of Christ. I'm getting tempted. I'm beginning to doubt. I lack. I lack. I need to get to the point where I say, because I lack, I need to go to the one who does not lack. Rather than being like this man that James is talking about, like the waves of the sea, back and forth, back and forth, happy, unhappy, joyful, not joyful, delighting, not delighting. Oh, I'm, I'm so happy today. Oh, I'm so miserable by night. Never resting. If that sounds like you, if that would characterize you, is that a, if, is that a typical day in your life? I would say it's because you're not seeing who you are in Christ. Maybe. You don't even have Christ. I don't know. I'm not the judger of men. But this double-minded man is, is really, in the Greek, a double-souled man. He's, he's really trying to be in Christ, but not really taking all of Christ. No, church. By faith, we take all of Christ. And by faith, we take all of Christ to all of life. It begins by that. It begins by doing that in every sphere of life. Church, we can approach the God who is the creator of heaven and earth. Lord, we can come to the Lord who literally is holding all things in his hands. We could come to God truly asking in faith. We're coming to the throne of grace boldly and confidently, church. I mean, it's on us. It's on us. We think too little about who God is. That's what it comes down to. We have a mountain and mountain a mountain of blessings. And we're hanging out in the areas that don't even relate to God. I literally feel like sometimes I can't preach this God. I don't have the words to tell you how magnificent He is. I don't have the eloquence to... You know, and even saying I could per, uh, have the words or the eloquence is showing you how short I come. I can't display to you the type of God that we have. But by faith, you need to know that you have far more than I can ever explain in this text. You have more resources at your disposal than I can ever number by any number on this earth. You have more in this biblical God as a child of God, a co-heir with Christ, you have more. You should not be double-minded in any way. You should not be unstable in any regard because you have Christ. I, I, I literally feel like I just preach the same sermon every week, but I honestly do not care. All I want you to see is God for who He is. His loving kindness, His, 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 His gospel, His his wisdom, His plan. Let me show you the type of God that you have. It's the type of God where Job can say, though He killed me, I will still bless Him. Why? Because Job has God. That's what it comes down to. He took my family. He took my children. He took my blessings. He took it all. But He did not take Himself. Let me show you, church, in the most uh, uh, horrific of events, church, God accomplishes the most deep reality of blessing that we've ever known. You want to see the Lord's wisdom. You want to see the Lord's plan. You want to see the Lord's uh, perfect 
a decree coming to pass. You want to see what makes a Christian be rock solid in who his God is. Let me show you where this takes place. When you begin to doubt, when you begin to worry, when you begin to wonder if your God really loves you, look to what he did to his own son. He crushed his own son. He killed his own son. Look to the cross that is called our wisdom. What the world calls as a shame, as folly, we look to that cross and say, on that cross, the Son of God was killed for my sins. He was given up for me and for you, dear Christian. Upon that cross, the Lord of glory hung there in shame and misery, suffering under His Father's wrath. Because on that cross, Jesus Christ was abandoned. He was forsaken. He truly was the one who suffered my sin and and paid my debt at the cross you see the wisdom of god you want to see god take care of you look what he did for you on the cross you want to say god how can i be sure you love me look what he did to his own son lord how can i be sure you'll take care of me tomorrow look what he did for you when you were still as enemy it's always going to be from there and i've said this a thousand times but until we get this Look what he's done. He did not spare his own son, church. How will he not graciously give us all things like wisdom? The foolishness of God is much wiser than the most shrewd of men. So look upon Christ. Look upon him. Feast upon him. Upon that cross that you're beholding in your mind. You need to look at that cross and say, on that cross, God's perfect wisdom is on display. His perfect plan is on display. His ability to take care of His children is on display. His love for His enemies, His love for His children, His holiness, His wrath, all of who God is, is there at the cross. And we're supposed to look at that and say, if He's done that, if He's done that, what concern do I have? That's where we get to the point where we say, because Christ died for me, I lack nothing. Sometimes when people ask me, oh, how are you doing? I literally think that people probably think I'm lying to them because every time I say, I'm just so happy in Christ. I have Christ. Yes, I still battle the flesh. Yes, I still have those pullings of the flesh. But I can honestly tell you, church, from the truest, most deepest part of my heart, I am so satisfied in Christ. When we lost our, our, our child, it hurt. But I was so satisfied in Christ. He gave me His Son. He purchased me from the pit of hell. He rescued me. He called me in. And if He's done that, you think I'm going to tiptoe my way into the throne room and asking for things like a scared little orphan? No, I'm running to the throne of grace, laying a hold of my Father and pleading before Him, Lord, You've already done that. Take care of me here, Lord. Until we get to that type of devotion to our God, we're never going to know true, true power in the Christian life. This is where power from on high comes from. It's by beholding what God has done for you in the person of Jesus Christ. And so quickly applying this, because I could stay here. This is where I want to stay. I I just want to preach about Christ the entire time, the cross the entire time, the beauty of Jesus and all things. But quickly applying to this church, That's the first thing you need to think about when you make any decision. Who am I in Christ? What have I been given in Christ? Does my worry compare to what I've already received? And when you begin there, then you begin to slow down and you begin to make decisions that actually glorify the Lord. Because you're first beginning with who you are in Christ. You're first beginning with a security in Christ. And then you make decisions based off of that. But going on beyond that church... We need to have children that aren't foolish. One of the saddest things is seeing Christian churches that have some of the foolish kids in them. Raise wise children. How do you do that? Showing them who Christ is and what He calls them to. Church, we need to be part of a local body. Part of God's wisdom, the pillar and buttress of truth, is the church. The reason a lot of Christians go astray, no no one's holding them accountable. They're doing whatever they want and making decisions left and right when there's no brother saying, that's not right. You shouldn't treat so-and-so like that. We need this body. This is where wisdom is on display. We need to be people of the Word. That's where wisdom is written down for us, church. We need to be truly walking as those who take their self-discipline seriously. And church, to the extent that we do this, 
when we are truly walking in who we are in Christ, with our wisdom in Christ, when we truly look to His Word, which is His wisdom written down for us, when we're truly depending upon Him, going to Him, when we're doing all these things, when we're living life as those who are uh, walking this, the, 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 this pilgrimage, as it were, depending upon God, Philippians says that as we do this, as we rejoice in the Lord, as we delight in Christ, this is the world's destruction. That's what Paul says. That as he's suffering to the glory of God, it's their destruction. Church, you're going to have articles thrown at you. You're going to have every YouTube video sent at you. There's going to be a thousand things trying to get you to be scared of the future, of global warming, of all that fear mongering. All that is trying to be thrown down your throats. It's trying to make, be, make you be scared to live the Christian life. It's trying to make you pull out of the fight and go hide in your little houses and never see the light of day. Everything is trying to pull you away from Christ. This is why we, we need to have wisdom. This is why we need to truly live this life in community with Christ as our Lord. And to the extent that we do this, the enemies will have their destruction. Let's be those who make wise decisions, church. Why? Because we have wisdom. Whose wisdom? His name is Christ. How does He come to us? In His gospel. How do we know this? By His word. How do we take this? By His spirit. It's all top down, church. Don't think too little of this. Go to Christ and stay there, church. Let's pray. Lord, we have more than we need in Christ. We lack nothing. If we ever begin to doubt that, if we ever begin to worry about that, just cause us to remember the, the cross on which the Lord of glory died. When we survey that cross, oh, all the things of this earth lose their pool. Lord, we need wisdom. Wisdom is Christ. Feed us Christ. Even now as we turn to the Lord's Supper, feed us Christ. For here on display in the elements of the Lord's Supper is your wisdom for us. Your wisdom in the gospel. Your wisdom of giving up your son to, cl to cleanse us from our sin. To clothe us in his righteousness. Your wisdom is about to be partaken of at the Lord's table. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. As we turn our attention.